Could you use the mic? I can probably do it. You want to use the mic? Check, check. <laughs> All right, so uh, we'd like to get started. Uh, first, I want to clarify I'm not Professor Todd Melston. He's an <laughs> official host uh, for uh, Professor, uh, Professor Advi. Uh, I'm Jason Kahn in the computer architecture field, but I have the honor to introduce our last distinguished speaker of this uh, academic year. Um, uh, Professor Vikram Advi from uh, University of Illinois, uh, we're talking about the virtual instruction set of computing. Um, Vikram has done uh, many uh, important research. His research area includes automated techniques for diagnosis, software failure, security solutions to minimize the need of application uh, to trust the underlying operating systems. But the most importantly, and uh, he together with Chris Lander are known to be Mr. LLVM, which is probably one of the most widely used uh, compiler infrastructures. And actually, I have the, uh, I mean, I really enjoy this opportunity to do the introduction because I can add a little bit of personal touch. Uh, I will, I'm proud to say that uh, my group at UCLA probably was one of the earliest users of LLVM back in 2004 that uh, we were looking for uh, compilers allow us to compile C, C++ programs into uh, circuits. And uh, my research group uh, told me, say, hey, we found this compiler out of Illinois called LLVM. I said, I never heard about it. <laughs> Are you sure it's good? And uh, we actually went through the documents carefully. We were very impressed by the, uh, everything we have seen. So we start building on our research around that. So that's LLVM version 1.3, just for uh, your information. And then two years, <laughs> a long time ago, two years later, and uh, the students working on this project uh, uh, were graduating. They had a fantastic result uh, just to show that you can really go from high-level behavior specification into circuits. And uh, there are people in industry who are using that. So we spin off the company called Auto ESL. And uh, that actually, again, was built on top of LLVM. Uh, at that time, I look at around, I think we are the only company actually taking that technology go all the way for circuit generation. And we also had uh, Vikram as the advisor of the company. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the uh, Auto ESL was acquired by Zadinx in 2011. I was visiting them early last year. I said, how things are doing? They told me it's fantastic. And uh, guess what? They have uh, over 6,000, 7,000 users. So that all added to your LVM, that the <laughs> user base. And Autopilot, right. So for that, and uh, Chris Lenner and um, uh, Professor Adby uh, joined received the ACM Software System Award uh, in 2012. So if you look at the list of people who are getting this award, it's just an incredible honor. Right. With that, uh, let's welcome Professor Adby. Well, thank you very much, Jason. So I want to uh, say one more thing. Um, I don't know if you know this, but LLVM actually benefited tremendously from the use by your group and later by Auto ESL because LLVM only had f had fixed numbers of integer types like 16-bit and 32-bit and 64-bit integers and 8-bit, uh, of course. But in order to support circuits, we added an arbitrary precision integer uh, capability in LLVM and it was motivated by the work that your group was doing and it still exists and it still causes a huge amount of pain to people building backends who want to compile you know, 15-bit or 29-bit integers down to some arbitrary architecture that doesn't support it. But it's been a, an important extension to LLVM also. I'm sorry? Called APN. Called APN, yes, exactly. Excuse me one second, I forgot to plug in my um, mouse thingy. Let's take a moment, hopefully not cause the whole machine to crash. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna talk about is not a single project, but more of a, a concept, a way of building systems that we call virtual instruction set computing. And uh, I guess before I go on, let me just say that this is joint work with a number of my PhD students. Um, John Criswell is the lead author on all the security work that I'm going to be talking about, which is a substantial part of the talk. 
And Chris Latner was the lead student on the work on LLVM, and he really is Mr. LLVM. He's done a tremendous amount of work on it. Um, so just to explain what I mean by virtual instruction set computing, let me show you what, I, what the traditional model of compilation is, which I expect most of you are familiar with. And let me emphasize this is for static languages like C and C++ and Fortran and many, many other such languages. For all of these languages, compilers since the earliest days have basically generated native machine code for each file of the input program, linked that native machine code together, and that machine code is what's shipped to the end user's machine. Right? And this model has existed since, since the early 50s when the first Fortran compiler was built and many, many languages have been built, all of which basically use the same model of compilation. And really the only significant change that's happened for these languages is in the 90s when production compilers, commercial compilers added link time optimization. So they basically exported some richer information for, for individual files in the internal representation of the compiler. So IR here is the compiler internal representation, which gives you much richer information than machine code. And so you can do better, more sophisticated optimizations with it at link time. But then even in this case, the linked and optimized code is then translated to machine code at the developer's end, and it's still machine code that's eventually shipped to the end user's machine. So this model hasn't really changed since the 50s. Now, um, in contrast to this, what I mean by virtual instruction set computing is that the code that you ship from the developer's site to the end user's machine or the user site is not, the, is not machine code, but it's some virtual instruction set. And this virtual instruction set is typically something that enables much richer analysis and transformations than what a native hardware architecture can do. And this is not a new idea, in fact, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but the point, but to finish the, the picture here, you can take this virtual instruction set code and compile it to native code either when you're installing the software or you can do it just in time as is done for Java and C Sharp and many other managed languages. You can even take it and do additional optimizations at runtime using profile information from executions. You could even in theory take those profile information and optimize the program further between executions which we call idle time. Although I don't know any system that actually does this. But I think it's an interesting idea. And you can build you know, managed languages this way by using this JIT as the, uh, uh, the translator for managed languages. So this is a generic picture of a virtual instruction set computing model. And as I said, this is not a new idea. In fact, like many ideas in, in compilers, this was developed at IBM in, in the very early days, in the 70s. And there's a whole range of mid-range mid computers from IBM, starting with the System 38, the AS400, the I-series, the, today the power systems that all use this model. But with a very sort of, uh, pro, it's a proprietary and very idiosyncratic virtual instruction set, which really doesn't work for, for non-proprietary systems. But there are other much more popular and well-known models of this. Managed languages are probably the most well-known one and most widely used one by far. And in this case, the virtual instruction set is the bytecode. So it's either JVM bytecode or CIL bytecode for .NET or something like that. And this is used for many languages like Java, C Sharp, F Sharp, and so on. And these are typically compiled by doing just-in-time code generation down to machine code. And usually, there's some kind of adaptive optimization at runtime. And by the way, when I say x86 here, that's just to make this concrete. That's just an example of a machine instruction set. It could be any native uh, machine code architecture there. So this is one and most probably the most widely used example of virtual instruction set computing. Another example that's, that's fairly popular in a, in a niche domain is in the world of GPGPU or GPU computing, where languages like CUDA and others are compiled into a virtual instruction set. For example, CUDA uses one called PTX, and this virtual object code is compiled to the particular GPU that you want to use, typically at load time in a device driver. And the major benefit of this is that it allows hardware designers to evolve the GPU architecture with much greater freedom than you would have otherwise, because they don't have to be binary compatible with all the applications that are out there. The applications can be translated down at a late stage. And that's a major benefit for the architecture world. But as far as I know, the, G, 
the GPUs are the only ones that actually to take advantage of this. Other than in today, and IBM used to do this in the System 38 a long time ago. Um, so these are some examples of virtual instruction set computing in the real world. But there are some very broad and important classes of software that do not get any of the potential benefits of this kind of computing, which I will talk about um, in the rest of this talk. And in particular, uh, na the native compilation model is pervasive today for two important classes of software. One of them is high performance software, which is largely shipped as native code. And here I'm not just talking about high like supercomputing applications, but media processing, games, finance, CAD, web browsers, numerous, numerous libraries, many, many other classes of software that care about performance and are written in languages like C, C++, Fortran, and others are shipped as native code. So all the compilation happens on the developer's end. Nothing happens on the user's end other than execution, typically. System software is the second class. And system software, by that I mean operating systems, hypervisors, even managed runtime systems like JVM and .NET implementations. All of these are typically shipped in fact, today almost exclusively shipped as native code. So they're compiled on the developer's end, executed on the end user's machine. Um, and uh, so these two classes of software really get no benefits from the ability to, to delay compilation to a later stage in, in life. And the first point I want to make here is that this native model of compilation is in some sense an anachrony that both software and hardware um, have moved to a point where native compilation is not a good model anymore. So for example, uh, modern software architectures use things like dynamic libraries extensively and you don't have information about them. You often don't have information about them when you're originally compiling the code. User installed software extensions are becoming more common. So web browsers typically use soft, uh, extensions that are loaded or that are uh, installed by users and only available at the end user's machine. There are many, software uses many layers of libraries and frameworks. They also use complex data structures for which information is really only available at runtime or, or most of it is only available at runtime. And so what you would like to be able to do is to optimize software using of course program analysis and so traditional optimization techniques, but you'd like to be able to do it on the end user systems when there's much more information available to you. And native compilation doesn't give you that. Similarly, hard, modern hardware has outpaced the ability of traditional compilation to deal with it. So in particular, modern hardware has much greater diversity within a single instruction set architecture class. So for example, um, within the class of let's say x86 processors or within the class of ARM processors and, and any particular processor family, memory hierarchies vary tremendously and, may, and memory hierarchies, different memory hierarchies can give you significantly different performance characteristics. And in fact, this is why for example, libraries like Atlas for matrix multiply or FFTW for, uh, for, for, for fast Fourier transforms do a significant auto-tuning step on the end user's machine and get quite dramatic improvements in performance because they're auto-tuning for the characteristics of the end user's memory hierarchy. Um, vector instruction sets vary significantly from one implementation to the, to the other. And so for example, vector lengths can go from 128 to 256 and in the future 512 and can make a significant difference in performance. GPU compute hardware can be quite widely varying. A major one that exists today and, and is becoming a, a, a particularly significant problem is on smartphones and tablets, the application processor is highly heterogeneous and it's difficult for apps to use all of the different heterogeneous hardware that's available on different phones because they have to preserve port object code, binary object code portability. So what you again like to be able to do is to adapt software to the end user's hardware, but that requires doing analysis and transforms on the end user's machine. And native compilation doesn't really support that very well. A third trend which is uh, becoming increasingly important is a security issue which is that untrusted code is becoming increasingly important in today's environments. So by untrusted code, um, this can be things like extensions that are downloaded and added to browsers, 
Uh, web pages routinely today come with executable code like JavaScript code, which has to be sandboxed. Mobile applications, when you go to download an app from Apple or Google or one of these people, you have very, very little idea of, of the developers who develop these apps. And trying to enforce security properties on these apps has become critical for the mobile marketplace. And these are just some of the examples of how untrusted code is becoming increasingly important. Again, the point here is what you'd want to be able to do is to do some security checking, which requires program analysis, and often instrumentation of the code to enforce security properties, which requires program transformations on the end user's machine. <clears throat> so in all these cases, what, and by the way, there's a, a nice example of a way you can solve this problem that doesn't work with native compilation very well, but works very well with WISC, is a feature of Chrome called Portable Native Client, that's PNACL, where they ship code in a, a bytecode form and then apply sandboxing techniques on, when I say code, I'm talking about browser extensions, they ship browser extensions, and then apply sandboxing to those browser extensions in a way that's portable across multiple architectures because the bytecode form allows them to uh, both get portability and do the security checks. In fact, I'll say a, a couple more words about that a little bit later. So one question you might ask right now is, there's been a lot of research over the last three decades or four decades on improving the ability to do analysis and transformations of machine code. Wouldn't that be good enough? Couldn't you try to use that on the end user's machine? And the short answer is, no, it is really not even close to what you want. So one way to think about it is that you have, in every situation in the real world, you have some finite analysis budget, whether in terms of time or memory or, or battery power or whatever it is, and you have to spend that on the analysis and the instrumentation. And if you're starting with machine code, you will spend a significant part of that budget just to lift that code up to some approximation of what a compiler IR might give you, the kind of information that you get like control flow, and even just telling which is code and which is data, or type information, or any of those things are, are quite difficult to extract from machine code. And then you can spend the rest of your time doing the analysis that you want to do. But the alternative is if you have something closer to a compiler IR, you can spend that entire budget doing the analysis. And yes, these techniques are getting better and better, but really what those do is bring this, the quality of this information a little closer to what is available in a true compiler IR. But it is extremely difficult to really get close to what you have today in a, in a compiler IR. In fact, to some extent, it is a fundamental limitation, and there are many reasons for this. I won't go through all of them uh, uh, piece by piece, but just to touch on a couple of them, that are important, first, the semantics of the instruction set architectures is quite complex, which makes both analysis and transformation very difficult. Second, the memory model that's used by binary code is really painfully low level. It's basically just a bag of bytes. That's all you know, an array of bytes, and all and everything that you have to analyze about the behavior of the code has to determine which bytes are which, so which is code and which is data. Even something simple like that is difficult to detect. And uh, this also makes it quite difficult to transform machine code and instrument it in a way that doesn't break machine code programs. Virtually all dynamic machine code instrumentation libraries are incomplete in the sense that they will break some program or other. It's really difficult to be uh, sound and complete. And advanced tools like PIN from Intel have given up on the ability to do static analysis. They just do only dynamic analysis for the subset of code that's actually executed. So, Machine code is really not enough. Now, let me just add one thing here, which is uh, uh, that machine code analysis, binary analysis is inevitable. We are going to need it no matter how close we come to this ideal goal of, of shipping code as virtual ICs, because there will always be uh, proprietary libraries or legacy code that are used by software and in a practical setting that's always going to be needed. But the hope is to, to reduce the need for that as much as possible. So that brings me to the message of this talk, which is that what we propose is that all future software should be shipped in some virtual instruction set form. Um, now, I don't necessarily claim that they all should all use the same virtual instruction set. That is not, 
That's not the important point. The point is that you want a virtual instruction set for individual systems that enable sophisticated analysis and transformations on the code. And one exception is very small embedded systems where you really have an extremely limited power budget. But even smartphones today are not a problem. You can do it comfortably on smartphones. In fact, Android does it all the time because they use um, Dalvik, which uses a virtual machine to JIT translate code to the native code. And um, the reason why I think this is the right thing to do is because first, the security benefits can be quite significant. And I'll be talking about some, of, some examples of that in the next part of this talk. Second, there are no inherent performance penalties. So in particular, if you ship virtual instruction set code, you can do install time code generation, and you, can get, you should be able to get the same performance that you get if you did code generation at the developer's machine. And if you can get the same performance, if you, if you have your virtual ISA designed correctly, there should really be no, no performance penalty. Moreover, there are a number of quite powerful performance optimization put, um, opportunities which you could take advantage of, which today static compilers are unable to do because they don't have the dynamic information, they don't have the information about the end user's machine, the hardware. Now I don't have, I'm not gonna be talking about that much today, this is work that we're just starting to do uh, on the new performance benefits that you can get. But there are some existing examples in, the, in uh, today's systems that, that are good evidence of this already. Jason? Just a quick question. Uh, yeah. This virtual ISA, is it the same as the IR? So it doesn't have to be the same as the IR. Um, in our system, it happens to be, because in LLVM, the IR and the virtual instruction set are exactly the same. But it doesn't necessarily have to be. But you would like it to be comparable. You'd like the amount of information to be comparable to an IR. Yeah. Any other questions? And by the way, I would welcome questions during the talk. Um, so feel free to interrupt if you have any. Yeah. So is this language then going to be sort of intermediate in complexity between the machine code and, and C, for example? That's one way to think about it. Yes, that's a good design point for a virtual instruction set. So you want that language to be comparable to so, so the kind of information that you want to have there is something that's language neutral, so that you can support arbitrary programming languages, but also something that's architecture neutral, so that it's retargetable to many different architectures, but retains information like control flow graphs and some data flow information, some basic type information, things like that. And I'll show some exam an example of this. So then this will be the idea is this something that's perfect to compile on the latest machine? It could be either way. You could build interpreters, but typically you'd want to compile it, yeah. That's a good question. So I get this question um, often. There are a number of both technical and practical reasons why shipping source code is a problem. Um, first, um, analyzing and, uh, uh, and linking together source code is quite significantly more expensive than the post-processed version that you would ship to the end user's machine. So you'd, you'd need much more infrastructure on the end user's machine to be able to analyze and process source code. There are many more header files and other things that have to be included in the, uh, in the with the compiler to be able to process source code. Um, I think one of the, so just to keep the answer short for now, one of the most fundamental limitations is that there are in many cases proprietary um, packages that are shipped, that are available as source to the developers but cannot be licensed to all the users of that system. And so you could not possibly ship the source code of those packages, even if you want to link it into your application. But applications routinely ship the code after it's been compiled. And so if you include that code in virtual instruction set form, that licensing problem goes away. Only the developers have to license that code. And this is a major problem in practice. as opposed to binary interval code. So this is probably the most common question we get. Actually, the second most common after JIT compilation. But, um, so one thing to understand is that reverse engineering of this virtual instruction set code is marginally easier than reverse engineering binary code. But reverse engineering of binary code is actually still perfectly possible. It's binary code by itself is not a sufficient protection against intellectual property. 
In fact, languages like Java and C Sharp um, and Dalvik in the Android world would simply not be usable if people cared about um, shipping virtual object code. Because if you think about it, JVM bytecode and, and .NET bytecode is much closer to the source language than machine code is. So the, the really only significant and useful defense against reverse engineering is to use code obfuscation tools that do things like rename variables, anonymize variables and types and function names and, and obscure the contents of strings and things like that. Because reverse engineering is so much a manual process using human intuition to try to reconstruct what the program is doing. And so the right solution is to, um, re to obfuscate the code if that's what you really care about. Someone else have a hand up? Okay. Okay, and by the way, I will come back to some of these um, questions about whether or not a virtual instruction set thing is really practical in practice towards the end of the talk. Um, <clears throat> but so let me keep going here. So in fact, that is the third point I was going to make, that in fact using a virtual instruction set is both technically feasible and commercially acceptable. And languages like JVM, like Java and C Sharp are very strong evidence of both of these points because they are both virtual instruction set computing examples. So in our group, we've been working on a number of different projects that all sort of support this idea. Um, and there are four components here. I'm really only going to be talking about the first two much. The first is the a compiler infrastructure called LLVM, which you can think about as the compiler foundation of WISC, uh, a compiler foundation of WISC. Um, it defines a virtual instruction set and a compiler infrastructure can, that can be used for supporting WISC um, systems. The second project is an extension of LLVM that can be used to host a complete operating system. And um, we both designed that and also used it for a number of security uh, benefits. So we've shown some examples of how security can be made better in, in quite novel ways if you have this capability. And that's the secure virtual architecture work and I'll talk about that um, also. A third project which is just starting up is for heterogeneous parallel systems like smartphones and tablets where a major problem is portability, um, both for functional portability and performance portability. And we're extending LLVM to support this. I'll just have a couple of slides on this. If I have time, I will talk just that much about them. And then we're now just starting up some work on more aggressive performance optimizations, which essentially enable new optimization capabilities across traditional software boundaries, like between uh, applications and dynamic libraries, or, or even multiple, even the application and the operating system and so on. But I don't really have much to say about that, so I'm not gonna say anything more in this talk. So um, let me start with LLVM. So LLVM is, looks operationally very similar to the WISC picture I drew earlier, where uh, LLVM is completely language neutral, and so you can write, develop front ends for arbitrary programming languages, which, de which generate the LLVM internal representation, which is also a virtual instruction set. And um, you can then link them together, do interprocedural optimization across file boundaries at link time on the LLVM representation. And then you can ship the code as LLVM code because it's a full self-contained executable architecture. And that code can be translated to machine code at install time. It can be jitted down to the, to the machine. You can use additional optimizations at runtime for this. And people have built a JVM. Um, uh, there's a commercial, uh, sorry, it's an open source uh, implementation of .NET called Mono from Novell that uh, is built on top of LLVM using LLVM as the JIT compiler. Um, and so you have all of these capabilities that are built on top of the virtual instruction set representation and, and internal compiler internal representation of the system. And just to give you a very quick flavor of what the IR looks like, I have a simple example here. Now I don't expect you to read all the details of this, um, of this code. I just point out a few highlights here. The, so what I have here is a, is a small fragment of C. It's a single function that sums up an array and the corresponding LLVM internal representation or virtual instruction set code. And 
Um, a few points to notice here are first that the operations here are completely architecture neutral. They're basically uh, standard operations like compare and branch, and I'll come back to fee in a moment, and cost and load and add and so on. It's completely language neutral. And in fact, people have built implementations of many different languages, including imperative languages, functional languages, managed languages, scripting languages, have all been built on top of LLVM. Um, LLVM includes an explicit control flow graph, so every so basic blocks identified by labels, every basic block ends in an explicit terminator. The terminators identify their successive uh, their successors. So the control flow graph is, is explicitly specified in the code. And Believe it or not, extracting a control flow graph from machine code is actually incredibly difficult. And that's one of the reasons why PIN works only with dynamic traces, because they cannot always extract a control flow graph. Second, LLVM is always in static single assignment form, SSA. SSA is a data flow representation that makes a number of compiler data um, uh, analyses and optimizations simpler and, and easier. And so for example, the fee instruction in LLVM is the traditional fee operation of classical SSA form. I won't go into the details of that, but the point is that you can directly do data flow analyses on the LLVM representation. And all the memory uh, locations, memory operations like loads and uh, integer and register register operations are typed. So you have enough type information to do some sophisticated analysis on top of this. So that's the LLVM IR. Um, and as I said, this is a fully executable instruction set representation. And it's been used by a number of different uh, product groups. So all of Apple's compilers now use this on Mac OS and iOS. And so LLVM replaced GCC as the primary compiler on all of Apple's systems. Cray uses it on their supercomputers. So their, so their Node compiler is built using LLVM. And both of these use both compile time and link time optimizations. In a sense, these are both native, traditional native compilers. They don't do any of the more, the stuff that I would call, that you'd want to do to, do, to be called WISC. The first, but there are some examples that are truly WISC systems. So for example, the first commercial product um, that used LLVM um, was the OpenGL stack in Mac OS where shaders are shipped in LLVM form and jitted using uh, at, uh, load time using the LLVM JIT. Um, and a number of compute languages like CUDA and OpenCL and RenderScript have all, uh, are all built on top of LLVM. And uh, Google's portable native client uses LLVM as the bytecode representation and does code generation at load time for browser extensions. So these are what I would call examples of WISC systems. But one observation here is that these are pretty narrow examples. The vast majority of performance sensitive code, virtually all system code is still compiled in the traditional native model. Even though LLVM does enable powerful analysis and optimization capabilities, and that's what, you, that's what used in the native compilers. So you can do everything a native compiler could do at, uh, at compile time and link time, could also be done at install time. And in theory, it could be done at runtime or in idle time within the, the, the time budget available at runtime. <clears throat> so it's a potential foundation, but it's really only been used in pretty limited context so far as a WISC, found, WISC system. So that's the compiler infrastructure and, and virtual instruction set. Um, let me come now to the security project that we've been doing where we looked at how you could support a commodity operating system on top of a virtual instruction set and what kinds of security benefits you could get with that. We call it secure virtual architecture. And the idea is that um, we want to be able to support a complete commodity kernel. For example, we've done both the Linux kernel and the FreeBSD kernel on top of this system. And so the kernel lives on top of virtual instruction set. That virtual instruction set essentially consists of the LLVM IR, which I just talked about, plus a small set of operations that look like a, a library, look like an API that's used by the kernel to manipulate hardware state. And the LLVM part of the instruction set is translated down to native code by a code generator. The SVOS part, which is the API, is essentially just implemented as a runtime library that's linked into the kernel. 
one important point here is that this library, this code runs at the same protection level as the operating system itself. It does not have a higher level of privilege. So it's not like a hypervisor in this sense that it is, um, it's a higher level of privilege on the kernel. It's the same level of privilege and it's linked into the kernel. And so the kernel can simply call SVOS operations as ordinary function calls. And now you can add various kinds of instrumentation to this SVOS layer, the SVA layer, to enforce any security properties that you want. And those are optional and I'll talk about certain security properties that we've investigated in our work. So that's essentially the SVA system. It's a, it's a virtual instruction set with these capabilities added um, to the kernel. And the translation here from virtual to native code can be done at install time, it can be done at boot time, it can be done at runtime. Um, in practice, we typically do it at install time, although I had an undergraduate who built a whole JIT that worked, that could JIT the Linux kernel as it was booting and launching new processes. It was a pretty remarkable project for an undergrad especially, it's phenomenal. But anyway, so in practice, we usually do it at install time. Um, so this is the, the SVA system and um, porting an operating system to SVA, ah, can you see the diagram? Okay, there's really not, not much you're missing here. There should be a, a little GIF thing that looks like a picture of a person typing on a computer. That's all you're missing, it's not important. But all it's showing is that there's a manual step involved. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever seen it missing. I don't know what's going on. But anyway, the point is that the way you would port a kernel to this is that you take an existing kernel and port it to this API, which is effectively like porting to a new architecture. It just happens to be a virtual architecture which actually simplifies it a lot because the architecture, the operations are much simpler and much more streamlined than what you would get in a traditional native architecture. And once you've ported it to that API, now you can compile it with a standard front end that generates LLVM uh, bitcode. And that's the kernel that gets shipped. And we have ported, or I should say, John Criswell, who did all of this work, including designed the SVOS API, ported both the Linux kernel and the FreeBSD kernel to this environment. <clears throat> so, and just to finish that part of the, the uh, one of the main points on that is, how much effort does it require to port this? Well, lines of code is not always a good representation, but it's probably the easiest one to measure and convey. So what I've measured here is, or what John measured here is the number of lines of code that had to be modified in the architecture independent part and the architecture dependent part. And um, as it turns out, all of the changes in the architecture dependent part, independent part here, were only required if you actually want to add a security property, which is memory safety. If you don't want to do memory safety, you actually don't need any of these changes here. The rest of the changes are all in the architecture dependent part because, as I said earlier, you're effectively porting to a new architecture. And overall, you're changing a little less than 1% of, so this is about 5,000 lines of code being changed in the kernel. And if one graduate student can do this in roughly the course of a year who was not initially familiar with the operating system, I think this is quite practical for an OS community to adopt and do. So that's the, and, uh, so that's the effort required to port it. Let me just give you a quick flavor of what the SVOS API looks like. So um, you can broadly break it down into two categories. There are operations to control the underlying hardware, and there are operations to manipulate the state of programs that are executing on the hardware. So for example, the OS, so all of these operations are used by the operating system, remember, it's the API of the OS. So the OS can use these operations to do things like registering a system call handler, registering an interrupt handler. So this example shows an interrupt handler being registered for a particular interrupt number, and that's the interrupt handler pointer. Uh, you can register trap handlers. All of the page table manipulation um, must be done using this API. And so for example, you can insert mappings at different levels of a, of a page table using operations defined by the SVOS API. And the implementation of the API then allows the runtime to supervise what changes are being made to the MMU mappings. And that's critical for a number of the security properties that we want to be able to enforce. 
You can do IO, primitive IO reads and writes this way. Um, on the state manipulation side, for example, if you want to swap out the state of a processor, that swapped state is stored in the SVOS runtime memory so that we can control what changes are made to it. Any changes made to that state have to be made through some of these other functions. You the OS cannot arbitrarily scribble on, let's say, a program counter or stack pointer or something like that in the saved state, because if you did, then all security guarantees would be basically uh, impossible to enforce, or I should say most would be impossible to enforce. And so, for example, if a kernel wants to deliver a signal to a particular user process, it could tell the SVOS API to push the signal handler identified by this pointer and a set of arguments onto the stack of the last saved uh, user space thread, the one that encountered the interrupt that's causing the signal to be delivered. Um, or if you want to manipulate the state of an interrupted program, there are operations to do that. So these are just some examples to give you a flavor of what the SVOS API looks like. So what is the point of all this? So what is SVA good for? Right? To understand that, it's worth uh, making an observation, which is that SVA provides a combination of capabilities that are not available in any previous system that we know of. And this combination is that it has the ability to do rich program analysis and transformation. So in, in other words, a fairly sophisticated compiler capability along with, and that's available in virtual machines like JVM and .NET and things like that. But it combines that with the ability to supervise the operations of an operating system, which are the kinds of things that a hypervisor can do. But, and it can do that because of the runtime library, the SVOS runtime library, which mediates all of the interactions between the OS and the hardware. And so this combination allows you to do, develop a number of novel solutions to security problems. And um, we've developed a few examples of these in our work. So this has been John Criswell's PhD thesis. Um, first, we developed the ability to enforce strong memory safety guarantees for a commodity kernel. And he did this for the Linux kernel. And I'll say a few words about that in a moment. We've also developed control flow integrity, which I'll explain in a little bit, also for a commodity kernel. That was for FreeBSD. And the third thing we did was to restrict the behavior of an operating system so that even if it is hostile, it cannot either read or tamper with the code or data of a secure application. So we can enable an application to preserve confidentiality and integrity, even on a hostile OS. And all of the, and it can do that using compiler techniques in particular. And all of these are the first systems to achieve these capabilities. And they were able to do that because of this combination of, uh, that SVA provides. So I'm only going to have time to talk very briefly about these. If, you have, if you're interested in learning more, I can certainly talk to you more offline. So the first one here is the memory safety. What this uh, system did is to extend SVA to provide a strong memory safety guarantee close to what you can get with the type safe language, like Java or C Sharp or one of those languages. But to do that for a large commodity kernel like Linux. And if you think of all the low level things Linux can do or FreeBSD any of these other kernels can do in terms of manipulating its own memory, manipulating its own program state, and um, the low level C idioms that are used in the kernel, this is actually a really tricky, uh, tricky job. <coughs> Um, and just to explain the implications of this in sort of less technical terms uh, or more practical terms, basically what this does is it prevents many, many, many common attacks on software like buffer overflows and heap corruption and code reuse attacks like return oriented programming and things like that. All of those become infeasible with, uh, if you have these memory safety guarantees. I won't go through the full list of specific guarantees that we give here, um, I will say that, so one important point here, which is both a weakness and sort of a novelty, is that we can guarantee memory safety without requiring garbage collection. And garbage collection, if you don't use garbage collection or some form of automatic memory management, you can have dangling pointers, right? You can have use after free errors or free after free errors and things like that. And in fact, those still might exist in the kernel. But we have 
a formally proved guarantee that even if you have such dangling pointer errors, you will not compromise any of these other guarantees that we give. So you won't have a buffer overflow and you won't have uh, you, you, a load store, won't access a memory location that's not predicted by the compiler and so on. Um, <clears throat> so that's the memory safety guarantee that we give using SVA. The second one is a weaker property, which is control flow integrity. But just to motivate why it's, that's useful, memory safety is a fairly heavyweight guarantee. It, it incurs some significant overhead. So the overheads can be anywhere from, from 5 or 10% all the way up to 40 or 50% per, as perceived by applications. Um, control flow integrity prevents attacks, exploits, from diverting the control flow of an application. So in particular, the guarantee is that control flow cannot be hijacked arbitrarily um, for the code you're protecting. Um, it will follow only those control flow paths that are predicted by the compiler. And again, we can do this for a large commodity kernel like FreeBSD. And uh, this includes both traditional, so control flow integrity has been investigated for a long time for user space applications. And the first two properties here are all that you need for user space. In particular, the code segment should not be tampered with. And all calls and branches, in particular indirect calls and branches are the dangerous ones, should only follow pr paths predicted by the compiler. And that's work that's been got, done in the, in the uh, community for a long time. To do this for a kernel, there are a number of additional things you have to protect, including things like context switching, which can now allow the program counter to be saved in memory, and a buffer overflow, which we do not prevent, because we're not doing memory safety, could overwrite the program counter in memory and so tamper with the control flow in arbitrary ways. And so context switching can actually corrupt control flow integrity. Similarly, interrupt and trap handling or MME management is a, is a huge one because if you can arbitrarily map physical pages into any virtual address, you can change program behavior in arbitrary ways. And so you really have to protect many, many more things than what user space applications can do. And John has developed a formal proof of uh, key theorems that guarantee that you're preserving control flow integrity, including even in the presence of all of these low-level kernel behaviors. <clears throat> and the third piece of work here is virtual ghost, which um, ensures that, so just to motivate this for a second, if you were developing a an application that you really care about, whose security you really care about, Maybe this is a financial application, maybe it's a, it's a national security application or something, something else that where it's really worth the time. You've taken the trouble to, to apply strong static analysis tools, to do really ex extensive testing, perhaps code reviews, things like that, to get as much confidence as possible that you have no security vulnerabilities in the code. But then you go off and run it on a commodity system, and systems like Linux and Windows and Mac OS and, all, and BSD and all of these have bugs. They all have security vulnerabilities. In fact, there are many different reported vulnerabilities in databases like BugTrack for these systems. And so your application now is no more secure than the underlying OS on which it's running because the standard OS has complete control over everything the, the uh, application does. So what we'd like to be able to do is enable an application to preserve its own confidentiality and preserve its own integrity. So even if the underlying OS is compromised, and we can do it even if the underlying OS is hostile, which is even more difficult. So effectively, you can have arbitrary hostile code in the OS and still prevent these kinds of attacks. And um, the, so just very quickly, the way we achieve this is that the SVAOS layer we extended it to provide some additional features. So first, it can give the application a section of memory that we call ghost memory, in which the application can store secure code and da secure data. And that ghost memory is not readable or writable by the operating system. And I'll explain how that is achieved in a moment. Second, the application is given a secure key. And all I.O. is still handled by the operating system, but the application can encrypt and sign any data that is transferred in or out through the OS before it uh, hands it off to ensure confidentiality and integrity of that data. And the operating system cannot read or write ghost memory and also cannot read or write the memory used by virtual ghost, for example, to save process state and other metadata that it uses. The way we do that is by using software fault isolation. 
which is a standard technique that's been developed in the compiler community for a long time to sandbox pieces of, of code. So essentially we use software fault isolation of the kernel to protect ghost memory and the memory used by virtual ghost. And this turns out to be a lot more efficient than using a hypervisor based solution, for example, where you would, where, which use the, which use MMU mappings and essentially have to switch page tables every time an app, the secure application makes a system call into the OS so that application pages are not accessible by the memory because of page mapping techniques. <clears throat> and we've also had to extend the control flow integrity guarantee that I talked about on the previous slide to prevent the OS from hijacking the control flow of the application. For example, through a signal handler, if it, developed a, if it delivered a, a signal to, to a, an arbitrary piece of code, that signal handler would execute in the application context and could steal data. And we have to prevent that to be able to do. This is <laughs> my backup system thing, not finding its disk. So Virtual Ghost also was implemented using SVA. And I haven't really gone into many of the technical details behind how these security guarantees are achieved, but let me just make one point here, which is why is this, why was WISC actually important for this? Fundamentally, these security policies all use compiler techniques to enforce, the, to provide the various security guarantees. And some of those, many of those security, uh, many of the program analyses that are required are very difficult to do on machine code. So things like extracting a call graph or doing pointer analysis or type inference or escape analysis, um, or very importantly, identifying low level OS operations would be very difficult to do if you just have arbitrary machine code. Um, there are other operations that we do that um, are compiler-based operations that could be effective on machine, that on machine code as well, but would just incur higher overhead, like software fault isolation and uh, enforcing control flow integrity. But the, the point here is that by having a virtual instruction set, you can do much richer analysis and transformations on the code, which enables the security guarantees that I just talked about. So that's the security work. So basically to summarize, WISC enables much stronger security benefits than what would be available if you only had machine code. Um, and so for example, we've shown strong memory safety for the Linux kernel. We've shown control for integrity for free BSD, application confidentiality and integrity in a hostile operating system, all enabled by using a WISC uh, environment, a WISC uh, system organization. So that's the security work. If if you have questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them because otherwise I'm going to move on to something completely different, which is um, heterogeneous mobile systems on chip. Um, and I really only have a couple of slides about this because we are running out of time here. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. The main problem here um, is that modern uh, smartphones and tablets use application processors that are highly heterogeneous. And these processors are typically a system on chip design with multiple CPU, so this by the way is an example of the Snapdragon from Qualcomm, but they have multiple CPU cores with their own vector instruction sets, a GPU, a DSP, multimedia accelerators, which are programmable, additional hardware accelerators, which are proprietary and I don't know what they are. Um, and overall there are at least six different hardware instruction sets on this one processor. These systems, these processors use incompatible memory system architectures. And moreover, they have different models of parallelism in each of these. Um, and you can also get parallelism across all of these. So you have several different models of parallelism all going on in a single chip. And this really is a nightmare to program. If you, as an application developer, if you want to write a parallel code for this kind of system. But what makes it far worse is that you typically want to have object code portability from across phones built by many different manufacturers, let's say for the Android, a particular version of Android. And these manufacturers will have different configurations of this hardware with different GPUs, which might not even be instruction set compatible, processors, cores, DSPs that are not instruction set compatible. And so using all of these accelerators becomes very difficult for the applications. The challenge here in, in some sense is that we don't have common abstractions for all of this heterogeneous hardware. And if you had common abstractions, that would go a long way to solving this kind of portability problem. 
So, our goal is to enable object code portability, not just source code, but object code portability and reasonable performance portability across a range of different SOCs um, using by developing common abstractions for them. And essentially the way we're going about doing this is by extending the LLVM virtual instruction set with uh, just a couple of abstractions of parallelism, which can be mapped down to all the different forms of parallelism that are on, on the underlying hardware. And we're focusing on some broad classes of programmable hardware, in, partic in particular CPUs, vector extensions, GPUs, DSPs, and semi-custom accelerators. And um, the two models of parallelism that we are experimenting with are a data flow graph with side effects so that a node in, in a data flow graph here is basically a piece of code that uh, may read or write global memory, but otherwise is uh, uh, like a standard data flow graph node. And edges are explicit data, flow, data transfers between nodes together with vector instructions. And really the motivation for vector instructions, even though vectors can be captured with data flow graphs with side effects, is that when appropriate, a vector instruction representation is much, can be much more compact and intuitive and easy to optimize and, and easy to understand. And so there are important practical benefits for having vector code. So it's, what we're investigating is a combination of these two capable uh, abstractions with one refinement, which is that a single node in a data flow graph is actually hierarchical. So a node may itself be a data flow graph. So it may include either vector code or it may include a data flow graph itself. And we are basically hoping to abstract away n different parallelism models of a single SOC with only two parallelism models. And at some late stage in compilation, which is like install time or, or uh, run time or load time or run time to map, to translate back to the actual hardware. So that's just another example of how this can be used in a, in a fairly powerful way. Okay, and again, as I said, that's all that I'm gonna say about this. I'm, I'm happy to talk to you more about this. So uh, let me just summarize by, by talking about the two points that I made earlier, which is that I think that WISC today is both technically feasible and commercially acceptable. There are a number of misconceptions or myths about virtual instruction sets that, and these are questions that we get all the time. One of the most common ones is, perhaps the most common one is, isn't JIT compilation too expensive and inherently gives you worse performance than static optimization? The critical point here is that you don't have to use JIT compilation. You can use install time code generation for static languages. And if you do that, there is no inherent reason to get any worse performance than code generation at the developer's end. In a sense, JIT compilation or just-in-time optimization becomes an opportunity. You can use dynamic information to improve, to improve performance better. You have to be very careful about it because you're doing it at runtime, but it's an opportunity, not a cost. Um, a second one is the question that, that um, you asked about reverse engineering, and I think I've already talked about that. The point here is that it's hiding behind binary code is really not a good defense. It's much more effective to use code obfuscation tools like ProGuard and DexGuard that's used for, that's available for Android applications. A third one is wouldn't WISC be too expensive for small devices? And the answer is yes. If you have really small scale embedded systems, it would be probably too heavyweight. But even for smartphones like Android phones, you're already doing this. Android already includes the Dalvik, um, which is Dalvik, which is a version of the Java Virtual Machine. It also includes actually LLVM uh, code generation for render script. So the render script programs to the GPU are JIT compiled using an LLVM backend. And it's done at runtime. So it's being done on the Android phones already. Um, a fourth question is, will system designers ever have agree on a common virtual instruction set? And here again, the answer is really relatively simple. You don't really have to have agreement. You don't have to have a single virtual instruction set. Any particular operating system, like the Linux community or the FreeBSD community, is free to choose its own virtual instruction set. The point is that that representation should be richer than what machine code gives you. 
And if you have that, then you have the ability to get all of the security benefits that I've talked about, the performance benefits that I have not talked about, but which I hope to talk about in the future. So that's more or less all I have to say. Again, my, what we're proposing is that all future shipped software, not just managed languages, but also static languages, which are used for many performance sensitive applications and for, and for a lot of system software, should be shipped in the form of virtual instruction sets. The security benefits are significant. Um, there are no inherent performance penalties. And as I said, it's both technically feasible and commercially acceptable. So uh, the papers and um, the source code for both the LLVM project and the SVA project are available on the web at these websites. And that's all I have. I'd be happy to take any more questions. <laughs> I'm sorry, it looks like I've run over a few minutes here. I apologize. Yeah. So I have one question relating to the performance portability. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically the taking into account any machine information. The basic the technique to what? Taking into account any specific machine information. Machine information. Say, I just want to have file in them and it's just going to optimize for that. Okay. But say now that this code is going to run on a machine with one core and a CPU unit. Yeah. Versus another machine with multiple cores but no CPU unit. Yeah. The backend compiler has a lot to do to yeah. transform the parallelism into the loop form. And so in that sense, <laughs> so, right, right. So, I definitely think that if you want to compile to explicitly parallel hardware, like vector hardware or GPU hardware, then just a straightforward virtual instruction set like the LL, the, today's LLVM virtual instruction set is not enough. You need abstractions of parallelism. And that's what we're doing in this heterogeneous computing work, right? That's absolutely true. If you're just doing multi-threaded code, today's compilers do virtually no optimization that takes into account the multi-threading. And so that problem is really not a problem, right? In a sense, it's, it's a missing opportunity, but it it's just doesn't exist today. And moreover, sure, sure. Yes, but I would argue that if they get smarter in that way, then they're using some information about the parallelism in the code, which needs to be captured in that virtual instruction set also. And if you can capture in the virtual instruction set, then you can do the same thing at install time. So now what we're doing for vectors and for um, uh, data flow graphs captures data parallelism very well. That's basically what we hope to rely on. An arbitrary multi-threaded parallelism is actually very difficult to analyze and optimize because it's very difficult to represent, right? And so um, you can do folk join for a limited class of programs and we've done some work on that. But in general, it's difficult to do our optimizations on arbitrary multi-threaded code. Moreover, one thing to remember is that at the front end, source level languages have some information that typically is language specific. And that can be lost when you go into a language neutral compiler IR. But the vast majority of optimizations, in fact virtually all optimizations, work at that language neutral level. The front end is just a parser and type checker. So the compiler IR is really the place where the information exists that's used by the optimizers. So the virtual ISA needs to reflect the information that's in the compiler IR. And that's really what LLVM does for today's languages and today's hardware. Okay. Milos. What are the issues in defining virtual instruction set architecture? So, there well, there are many engineering and, and more theoretical issues also. Um, so from a, I think from a, probably the most important ones are one, you'd like it to be language neutral so you can do it, use this for arbitrary languages. You'd like it to be architecture neutral as much as possible, at least within some range of hardware. And um, that's sort of, I think, the minimal set. The third thing I would definitely want, so maybe it's not, that's not the minimal set, but the, uh, another one is so the kind of information that's typically used in a compiler IR 
includes a control flow graph. It includes some type information about variables and registers and things like that. That kind of information you really want to be able to capture. Um, additional things, so for example, you can do better optimization on type safe languages than you can do on non type safe languages. And, for, and LLVM has attributes on types to, uh, and on, uh, on, uh, yeah, on types, on pointer types, to assert that the types are type safe because they came from a type safe language. So the language implementation will guarantee this. And that's the kind of thing you want to include in the virtual instruction set. Right? So essentially think about it as being language neutral, architecture neutral, and having the kind of information you want to do optimization, analysis and optimization. Since Mac OS, you said, Mika? Yeah. Mac OS, yeah. Mac, yeah. Mac, Mac OS, so yeah. It's just like, uh, sometimes it has like a, because they open source this code is uh, designed and tested with this DCC compilers. Yeah. There are a lot of like errors you're getting. Yeah, sure. If, since you're combining with LLVM. Right. That the, the, the source of the errors, how, how you can solve those are not like very well documented. And some simulation is using like OpenMP. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I agree. I think you should complain to Apple. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in general, when you switch compilers, these kinds of problems crop up. It's very difficult to make compilers fully compatible. Languages are not even, language standards are not even close to enough to make compiler behavior compatible. And so there's not really a good technical answer to this problem. Because GCC is so important, the uh, the LLVM community has made quite an effort to be as compatible with, G with the important GCC attributes as possible. But for example, the Linux kernel doesn't compile out of the box yet with LLVM because it uses GCC specific features that we don't support yet. Right? And now they're very corner case kinds of features. Almost no one else uses them, but they exist. So, OpenMP support is coming. It's, in, in, it's being developed right now. <laughs> Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.